So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan Engelbretsen. I'm a professor at the University of Oslo. And I'm very uh, happy to be invited to uh, to speak at this uh, extremely interesting uh, course. Um, so, uh, so thank you, Sara and team, for for organizing this and for for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about unimplementability of the SDGs, and I can we'll come back to what that is. And my talk is inspired uh, partly by the work that I'm doing at the University of Oslo, where I'm leading a center for sustainable healthcare education, which is a center of excellence that is funded by the Norwegian government. And uh, in this center, we aim to uh, encourage critical thinking uh, among health care workers or future health care workers uh, about the SDGs and sustainability. And the other source of inspiration is a grant proposal that I have submitted to the European uh, uh, Commission uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Trish Greenhouse. Uh, and where we try to unpack this this concept of, of unimplementability and use this as a kind of a, uh, a concept or an approach in order to to rethink the implementation of the SDGs on a global level. So I will share my a few slides. Um, here we go. There we are. So unimplementability of the sustainable development goals. And um, here's the plan for my, my short talk here today. Um, first, I will talk about the emergence of the sustainable development goals uh, and uh, a little bit about their at least intentional impact on health and also their underpinning principles, which I think are very uh, good in intention. Then I will switch to the question of politics and uh, the politics of sustainability and the politics of the sustainable development goals, which I will argue is often underestimated. Then I will try to unpack this concept of unimplementability and, and, and show what, what we mean by it and how it might be relevant in order to discuss the SDGs. And I will use the case of COVAX and the TRIPS, the so-called TRIPS agreement uh, about the lifting of patents uh, to, uh, during COVID to, in order to, uh, to illustrate uh, my more kind of general argument. And then I will, will end by, by, uh, by a call for a more critical approach to sustainability studies, uh, which I think is important. Okay, so um, the sustainable development goals, as you all know, these global goals were adopted by the United Nations in 2015. And they are extremely ambitious. They serve as the foundation for the so-called Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. And they aim to reduce social and economic disparities, to eradicate poverty, while also enhancing nutrition, health and well-being, and education for all. And they consist of 17 goals, as you can see here and 169 targets. And as you might know, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, they replace the former, the previous uh, global goals, the so-called Millennium Development Goals. And they are also distinct from the MDGs in some important ways. First of all, they apply to all countries. They do not distinguish between developing uh, and developed countries. According to the SDGs and the SDG uh, agenda, all countries are developing countries in the sense that, that they are uh, in need of a shift towards sustainable development. And they also uh, 
in a sense uh, are different from the from the MDGs uh, by at least on an intentional level wanting to address the root causes of global challenges such as poverty, inequity, climate change, and ill health. They do not only want to, to address the symptoms, but the root causes. Uh, and that means uh, that they take on a holistic approach to these various uh, challenges that the goals describe. The SDGs are based on the assumption that poverty, for instance, cannot be uh, addressed in isolation. It must be uh, linked to Ill, Ill health, it must be linked to, to climate, it must be linked to uh, inequity, and so on and so forth. So the SDGs insist that all the global goals are fundamentally interlinked and can only be addressed uh, together. And these are, I think, very good thoughts. I'm not against the SDGs, or I'm not against uh, sustainable development, not at all. I'm running a center for sustainable development in health. Uh, so it, be, it would be odd to be against it. But as everything else uh, uh, which society considered as inherently good, such as evidence or empowerment, or uh, quality, democracy, it needs to be scrutinized and it needs to be, uh, we need to attend to it in a critical manner. And that is the, that is the, the aim of, uh, of, this, of this talk. Uh, and so these, these ideas are in principle good uh, and they are also uh at least again on an intentional level uh introduced into the field of health and healthcare in different ways and uh, this is um uh on the left side here you can see a definition of sustainable health that we use at the university of oslo so providing high quality health care for all without compromising the ability of the next generation to meet their own needs and this is a uh, is uh, this definition is paraphrasing the original definition of of uh, of uh, sustainable development, which was introduced by our former prime minister in Norway, Gro Harlem Brundtland, in the so-called Brundtland Report, our common future, from 1987, and that was actually the report that first coined the concept of sustainable development. And uh, this report says that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So it is this radical anticipatory approach which is characteristic to, to uh, su sustainable development. And also, we argue, to sustainable health, that we need to address current health challenges using future, uh, the future consequences, future implications, uh, the need of future generations as a yardstick. And this also requires not only an anticipatory gaze, but it also, it also requires a systems lens. We need to take on a whole of society approach to how health is uh, can be approved. And the SDGs, and I think this is important, cannot be considered as a list of separate goals, as I said. But they also reflect, reflect some important key principles that underpin all the SDGs. And that needs to be taken into account when we talk about when we talk about sustainable development in a in a in in, in a health setting, but also in any other settings. And when we talk about implementing the SDGs, so it is about, as I said, a systems approach. Uh, 
It is about when addressing health issues, you need to uh, uh, you need to take both ecological, economic, and social dimensions so, of, of sustainable development into account. The 2030 Agenda insists that these three dimensions of sustainability, ecological, economic, and social, are closely interlinked and must always be, in, be considered uh, in uh, uh, together. So systems approach, but also as I as I as I already said, anticipate, anticipatory approach. That uh, and that's that's again the core of the Brundtland Commission definition that we cannot address current challenges and issues without looking at the need uh, of the future of of, of future. Uh, populations so we uh, so, and that also goes for health so we need to have a careful analysis and look at future consequences of our current actions and decisions and then the third uh, kind of principle which is equity and maybe the most used expression throughout the agenda 2030 is leaving no one behind. That the uh, that sustainable development is development that leaves no one behind. That it's a it's it's a development for all. And uh, and uh, I think that's uh, that's also extremely important again on a, on an intentional level. And it's very easy to agree with these principles. Uh, and I think these are good principles and important principles uh, that we need to, to work towards realizing. But the question is how? How can we, how can we fulfill these, these goals and principles? Um, a few more words about the implication of these intentions uh, on health and healthcare. Because at least again, on an intentional level, this might, uh, or these principles might change how we think about health. So it's, first of all, it represents a shift from, from a focus on, on, on treatment and, and symptoms and, and consequences of ill health to prevention, to promotion, health promotion, and also health preparedness writ large which is, reflects this, this uh, future-oriented approach to, to health challenges. And the same goes for also over-diagnosis and over-treatment. Uh, the fact that we need to consider uh, future consequences of our current health decisions means that we must take uh, phenomena such as overdiagnosis and overtreatment and uh, and uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance and that kind of, of of challenges into account, which requires us to choose wisely, which I suppose that you know is an international um, uh, kind of uh, movement. Uh, addressing the problem of overtreatment and overdiagnosis in health. Um, and then we have the more social aspect of sustainability, the, uh, which uh, reflects in the need for universal health coverage, which is the equity, equity approach that comes in. And also the question of social determinants so it's not about looking at the effects uh, only, but it's about looking at the root causes. And, and, uh, and that ill health is not only an individual uh, problem, but it's a societal matter. It is something that reflects dysfunctions in, in, in our society, uh, and uh, which uh, an ill health is fundamentally socially determined. And then, of course, uh, 
the link between health and climate. So the turn towards lower carbon footprint and energy efficient health care, and also the new notions of planetary health, uh, which in a sense expands global health, do not only consider uh, the effects uh, and uh, uh, on, on, on humanity, but also the link between the health of humanity and the health of our planet. And linked to this also the concept of one health, which sees uh, or insists that, that the health of, of the human health must be considered in relation to animal health and also the health of the planet. So these are some of the ideas uh, that the uh, sustainable development goals have triggered within the field of health. But, and now I come to the main message of this talk, why do these ideas fail to a large extent? And uh, I think it's a, it's a fact that the SDGs, we are now halfway uh, to 2030, and most of the SDGs are failing. And this is an article from Nature Sustainability, uh, which examines the um, implementation of the SDGs from three perspectives. So first from a discursive perspective, to what extent do people talk about the SDGs? A normative perspective, uh, in, in to which extent does the SDGs reflect in, in, in laws and, and, and regulation, regulations, and then an institutional uh, perspective, to what extent have actual programs been implemented. And their conclusion, um, which is actually quite disturbing, is that in most cases, implementation of the SDGs has been limited to talk, to a discursive perspective. So actions at a deeper uh, level uh, is uh, has been very, very limited. And we need to relate this to the question of politics and the sustainable development as a political project. And I think the political side of the SDGs, and more specifically the SDG implementation, which I will come back to, is often underestimated because there is something inherently political in the whole idea of a universal agenda. Um, it's something political, but it's something also something apolitical in the sense because uh, the agenda tends to, by using the concept of universal, uh, and by insisting on its universal character, the uh, SDGs tend to portray humankind as a single political group with a single political project. And this is, of course, a political move. But uh, so it's it's about being uh, uh, apolitical in a political way, and it it is political by marginalizing political differences. It characterizes uh, the, the the whole as the whole the the world as speaking with one single voice. So this has led Teleria and Garcia Arias to describe the Agenda 2030 as a depoliticizing political device that makes an inherently political issue look not political. And. One of these also, one aspect of this, uh, this politics of the sustainable development goals is that it blurs the agenda or the goals, blurs the distinction between a promise and an obligation. We have written about this in a short comment in the Lancet a few years ago. So here we, uh, we do a close reading of the agenda uh, 2030 and we, um, we uh, we identify a kind of a, uh, 
conflict in the text between a promise uh, and an obligation. On the one hand, there is, by analyzing the we, the people, the voice that is speaking in the agenda. So there is, a, on the one hand, there is the we, the people who makes a promise. We pledge, we, the nations of the, Uni uh, the United Nations, pledge that no one will be left behind. This is a promise on behalf of one we. But then this promise shall be fulfilled or realized through an obligation. Uh, where a new we and an expanded we comes in that goes beyond the we of the united, the national leaders making the promise. Now it is suddenly, suddenly for all of us to ensure that the journey is successful. It involves governments as well as parliaments, the United Nations system and other in international institutions, local authorities, indigenous peoples, civil society, business, and the private sector, the scientific and academic community, and all people. So the national leaders making a promise are making this promise on behalf of a much larger we, which is all people. And the problem with blurring this kind of uh, distinction between a promise and an obligation is also that the mechanism of, of accountability becomes very unclear. Because when everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. So again, it's a political move. I don't know if you recognize recognize this man, Paul Farmer. He is one of the uh, most important figures within global health uh, uh, in the last fifty years. He he unfortunately he died a year a year or two ago, um, and uh, I had the pleasure working a little bit with him, and um, he had some very, very radical thoughts regarding sustainable, uh, sustainable development uh, and how the concept of sustainable development in global health should be challenged. And he said that sustainable development is uh, not only both a promise and an obligation, but it is both a gift and a weapon at, as it is used in global health. So he says that on the one hand, sustainable development is a gift. Uh, it is development that shall not comprom uh, compromise anyone. Uh, again, the leaving no one behind principle. So it's an expression of a gift in the meaning of global solidarity, leaving no one behind, global equity, global solidarity. But at the same time, as often used in practice, when implemented, sustainable development is used as a weapon. Because medical treatments and technologies, uh, which we take for granted in the global north, are often considered unsustainable in the regions where they are the most needed. So, uh sustainable development becomes a kind of uh, weapon used against the poor inhabitants of indebted countries and uh, that this is how he he uh, frames the problem so sustainability the kind the kind of care that we receive isn't affordable or sustainable for them the poor inhabitants of indebted countries. And um, Paul Farmer, he uh, uses um, the case of, he wrote about this actually since early 2000, and he used the example of HIV medication, uh, saying that treatments that were taken for granted in the global north were often uh, considered as unsustainable 
in uh, in poorer countries where the need was even greater because they lacked uh, capacity in order to use uh, allegedly uh, to use these these uh, uh, treatment schemes in the right way and you see and i'll come back to that exactly the same argument reflected in the debate about covax and and uh, covid19 vaccines and uh, and uh, the lack of production capacity in in global south the lack of sustainability uh, uh, that are used against the people that need the needed the vaccines the most. And this is a paper that we wrote with, with Paul Farmer and a few other colleagues. Um, and actually we wrote this back in the 2016. So quite soon after the implement or the, the uh, ratification of the SDGs. But here we point to certain paradoxes in the use of sustainability in global health uh, and also how uh, the concept has changed and be and been co-opted from in the beginning being a kind of uh, uh, urge towards solidarity to becoming a neoliberal concept arguing for self-assistance so we try to show here by referring to, by analyzing OEC DAC documents from three, three periods that uh, the interpretation of the concept has evolved from implying enduring assistance to a particular project. Uh, so enduring uh, long lasting solidarity to denoting self-assistance. And by doing so, uh, sustainability is also transformed for being a goal, an objective of development aid to becoming a benchmark for assistance. So su sustainable development is not something that donors and recipients shall obtain together, but sustainability is, is a kind of a treat that the recipients shall have before they are worthy of assistance. So what we argue here is also that the new neoliberal concept of sustainability reintroduce a kind of an idea of the worthy needy in global health. So let's turn to the question about the implementation. Because this is how implementation is often envisioned in, uh, in, uh, regarding, with regards to the SDGs. And it's also the kind of implementation logic which is laid out in uh, SDG 17, which is about uh, implementation and also the indicator framework that accompanies the SDGs uh, with a set of metrics. So that there is a global vision for SDGs uh, and which is defined by the UN and which has a kind of uh, universal legitimacy, as I talked about, talking for all people, which is then translated uh, into practice, so to speak, through evidence-based interventions. And these evidence-based interventions, often in terms of indicators and metrics, they are also considered to be universally uh, applicable and uh, having kind of universal validity. And then by doing so, these SDGs or these global visions are translated into local delivery or local practice. And this is the kind of logic that uh, Trish and I, uh, in different ways, want to challenge. And we, we want to challenge it by insisting on the fact that this logic is not productive, that it simply doesn't lead to implementation. It leads to the opposite. It leads to unimplementability. And... <sighs> We 
when we do so, we introduce the concept of unimplementability and we lean on the medical anthropologist Charles Briggs and his discussion of uncommunicability when we do that. But we, uh, uh, because we, 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 we insist that implementability or we argue that implementability as a kind of an assumption a point of departure, this chain that we looked at, this is how it is supposed to happen. If everything goes right, this is how it is supposed to happen. It reflects an idea of modern, rational and liberal subjects. And it also, by the same move, it reflects the idea that unimplementability, uh, when it doesn't happen like this, it is a failure. It is, an, it is the result of, of actors not being capable of implementing in the right way. And th this is also uh, a similar criticism that Paul Farmer had when, uh, when the HIV medication didn't, wasn't implemented as they were supposed to in the global south. It was a failure of the people living there. It was an expression of people not being capable of implementing. So we want to challenge this by saying that we cannot use implementability as, uh, as a kind of point of departure uh, because there is something fundamentally problematic with this chain that I, I, uh, I, I showed you. Uh, actually, uh, this chain leads to unimplementability, uh, as we argue. Because it is framed in a particular way, already I, I talked about some of some aspects of this framing in terms of the the, the global voice, uh, marginalizing difference, and so on. Uh, it is monitored using using inflexible and questionable metrics such as the SGD indicator framework, which actually leads to failure. And it is enacted in bureaucratic ways that obscure key perspectives and practicalities, and also importantly, ethical questions. And all this leads to unimplementability. So this whole idea of if you follow this chain and the step, it will lead to implementability. That is, that is mistaken in our view. On uh, the opposite, it tr is true. It will lead to unimplementability. But we can. So we need to acknowledge unimplementability. We need to uh, harness unimplementability and to inhibit. Uh, it productively, rather than rather than taking implementability as a kind of a given point of departure, and this requires that we bring politics back to policy implementation. A major failure of policy implementation in general and, and also SDG implementation more specifically is that it is, again, going back to this chain, considered as a non-political process and thereby leading to false consensus. So, but we insist that uh, we need to bring politics back into policy implementation and uh, and to by fostering productive disagreement. And again, evidence-based interventions uh, considered universal, which comes with 
targets and success metrics, again, defined by some on behalf of someone else, they may come into conflict. In practice, they may come into conflict with local realities and leading to implementation of failure. And that is not, we don't want to see this as the failure of the people on the ground, which is the kind of hidden assumption behind the, the, chain, the, uh, the chain I showed you. On, it is the failure of the system. It is the failure of a way of framing implementation as non-political. So we need to bring these discussions, bring these local conflicts and disagreements back into the debate about implementation. And this is where we we'll lead on the Belgian uh, political philosopher Chantal Mouffe and uh, uh, her idea of agonistic pluralism. Uh, she argues that if differences, disagreements are surfaced, discussed and strategically harnessed, they can become a positive force. They can become what she calls agonistic pluralism. And she distinguishes agonistic pluralism or agonism from, from antagonism. Antagonism is open conflict, like in a war situation, while Agonism is productive disagreement within the space of, of uh, democratic and open debate. So, uh, but if we marginalize uh, agonistic pluralism, it will at some point lead to antagonism and open conflict, she claims. So let's turn to COVAX uh, as a case in point in order to illustrate some of these, these arguments. Uh, as you know, COVAX was a historic now multilateral effort aimed to accelerate the development and manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines and to guarantee, importantly, fair and equitable access to every country in the world. And it came to a close on, uh, on, in December in 2023. And this whole setup, this whole scheme was to a large extent a failure. Uh, so it's an example of a, a SDG inspired project which failed in practice. And why did it fail? Again, we analyze this by approaching it through our lens of unimplementability. We say that unimplementability was built into the framing of COVAX because it was primarily perceived as or, or it primarily perceived vaccine equity as an act of philanthropy. Uh, I will come back to that. And this approach uh, also uh, shaped and the unimplementability was strengthened uh, through metrics that tracked vaccine sales to the global south. And by doing so, overshadowing other approaches to the problem, other view, views on progress. And I want to link this to the TRIPS agreement, the so-called TRIPS agreement. Uh, and uh, in 2020, um, a few countries from the global south proposed a waiver from certain provisions of the TRIPS agreements or the World Trade Organizations, agree, uh, Organizations Agreement on Trade-Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights, uh, which is TRIPS. Uh, and this waiver would allow low-income countries to produce their own vaccines. So that was what this was about. Should, should, uh, should we lift the patents in order to facilitate uh, uh, production, uh, local production of vaccines in the global south. And many countries uh, in the global north, uh, inclu including EU, uh, but also supported by the UK, the US and Norway, 
uh, argued against this waiver uh, because they uh, considered the only solution uh, to the lack of, uh, of vaccines in the global south was global collaboration, as they said, which they interpreted and understood in a specific way. So global co collaboration meant a global effort to produce vaccines in high-income in, high countries and then distribute them to the rest of the world. So global collaboration become, be, be, became a concept that excluded local production of vaccine. And the point being that COVAX, global, which was global collaboration, was used as a justification for not expanding vaccine production capabilities in the global south. I think this is quite disturbing, actually, that COVAX, which has and, and an example of what Paul Farmer pointed to, that a gift is turned into a weapon, that the global solidarity idea behind in, in COVAX uh, and the idea of global collaboration was used to justify uh, that, uh, that uh, as a justification for not expanding vaccine production capabilities in, in the global south. And uh, together with a colleague, I wrote uh, a paper about this during, during the pandemic, where we did a close reading of the EU statement against this waiver. And we tried to, what are the hidden assumptions behind this, this, uh, this argument? And one of the sentences stated was that there is no indication that intellectual property right issues have been a genuine barrier in relation to COVID-19 related medicines and technologies. So they stated indirectly that the intellectual property rights and, uh, and uh, uh, was not a problem here. So it wouldn't help, it wouldn't help to lift the waiver or lift, lift the patents, because it, 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 it wasn't about intellectual property rights, they claimed. The real problem is to be found in the lack of manufacturing capacity in develop, uh, developing countries. And here we are back to the same argument as Farmer, Paul Farmer criticized in the late uh, 1990s uh, with regards to HIV medication that the problem was uh, in not in the global north, but in the global south and in their lack of capacity. So uh, put differently, the problem was in their incapability in of, implement, of implementing. They lacked the ability to implement. So again, as, uh, as I explained earlier, unimplementability became a failure that was ascribed to the people on the ground uh, here in the global south. And furthermore, they claimed that measures to tackle current and future supply side shortage must therefore be found outside the intellectual property rights system and include broad and equitable global distribution. So again, the key was distribution, not production. Uh, equity could only be realized through an act of philanthropy, once again. And they took it further because they said that the intellectual property rights system is part of the solution rather than an obstacle by being one of the main economic incentives to stimulate extraordinary efforts. So again, implicitly that the 
uh, that the e EPR system was here to protect uh, the interests of manufacturers from the global north. And this is why, uh, this is the hidden assumption behind the whole argument of, uh, of uh, distribution and not production. So I'm, uh, I'm going to conclude uh, now by um, uh, what all this show, in my opinion, is that we really need to rethink the uh, uh, whole concept of implementing the SDGs and, uh, and, uh, and sustainability. And we need to, more broadly, we need to think how about and rethink how we, how we, um, how we approach sustainability science also. Uh, in my center in Oslo, we have, uh, we don't want to talk about implementation at all. Uh, even if we are set up in order to, uh, contribute to the SDGs and to the sustainable development goals. We do not want to do implementation. We want to inspire critical thinking. We want to, uh, and we want to pluralize the concept of, and diversify the concepts and approaches to sustainability. And this is also in line with what Ferreira has described as uh, critical sustainability studies. Uh, that question a monolithic and top-down understanding of the sustainability agenda, which we have seen being reflected in, in the SDG implementation framework and in the case of COVAX, because there are different ways of seeing and knowing sustainability. So it's time to pluralize it in the literature and in the discourse. And critical sustainability studies encourages sustainability scholars and educators and policymakers to move from defined methodology of problem solving or implementation to a more critical moment of calling something into question. And this is the kind of educational agenda that, uh, that we are working to uh, support in Norway. To, uh, to inspire future health professionals to think critically about sustainability and health more generally, and to call political projects into question. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>